Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. What's going on, everybody, and happy Friday. Another solo pod for you, the lovely Red Hat gang. Big shout out to everybody over on All Hail Medical Sales over on Instagram. So guess what? The day has finally come where I get to review and share the details behind a book called The Salesman Surgeon, a book that is no longer published. If you try and find it on Amazon or anywhere else, it costs about 700 bucks, but don't worry. I got it for you because that's the purpose of the show. I bankroll things like this. And the salesman surgery is a uh, salesman surgeon is by a uh, William McKay, um, who was a medical sales rep. It was written back in 1978 and it's called the incredible story of an amateur in the OR operating room. What is it about? It blows the lid off a dirty secret the industry had, which was back in the day, not only were reps in the room, they actually scrubbed it and did cases. And so I'm going to detail all the juicy, um, wild stories from this. We did a vote on uh, All Hail Medical Sales. We had not as many as, as, as we usually do. So this time we had about 1,123 of you voted. And 75, yeah, 75% of you said that you wanted to hear about sales tactics. I'm going to outline the sales tactics he talks about this book. But then a, a second place uh, vote was like the wild stories. We're going to cover all of that. Before we do, a couple of announcements. Number one, if you live in the San Francisco Bay Area, okay, um, and or you're traveling there next week, next week being September 13th, I believe. Uh, let me double check. I always keep getting my dates wrong. Um, so September 13th, man, I should have had this opened up earlier on. There we go. So yes, September 13th, 1130 AM in San Francisco at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. I'm doing an in-person event with my uh, podcast partner and sponsor, Clary, amazing software company. Clary essentially is an AI company. If you have Salesforce, you definitely should invest in Clary. They plug into your Salesforce, they automate the data getting into Salesforce, makes your life as a rep easier. And then as a sales leader, they extract that data and provide predictable insights on revenue. So that way you can predict revenue like ahead of time. It's an amazing uh, platform. So we're doing an event called How Life Science Companies Can Boost Revenue with the Digital Sales Maturity Model. It's going to be me, their chief marketing officer, Kyle Coleman, who is uh, really well-known, respected in the SaaS industry. He was in sales and moved into marketing. And the one and only Daniel Hawkins, founder of Shockwave Medical, founder of Avail Med Systems. He was in, uh, intuitive employee number six, right? And so when he and when Daniel and I get together, um, we take the gloves off and we hit hard on the industry and how sales can be better. So that's a free event. Um, it's going to be at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. It's going to be an awesome event. Um, so the way you can register, it's free. Um, check the show notes below or just go to my LinkedIn and you can RSVP and show up. It's going to be at 1130 a.m. to 1215 p.m. Come meet me in person. It's going to be a great place to network. So that's number one. Number two, if you are a medical sales rep and you're ready to change, right, and you're ready to elevate the way you sell, right? I want you to join my program. I've been uh, getting more people into it, which is great. Teams have been signing up. I had an awesome training earlier today with Insight Tech, which is an amazing uh, uh, company. Maurice Ferre, who's the um, founder of Mako, founded this company. They're, they do incisionless neurosurgery. I just trained their team. But you can, as, our sing as an individual rep, take the investment in your own hands. I've discounted this this program for for solo pod. So instead of paying thirty five hundred dollars to get in, it's only nineteen ninety seven. You get all the content to learn how to sell at scale using social media, persuasion, emails, video, sales letters. You get the private group, which has uh, VP, CEOs, recruiters, other reps in it, and the live weekly calls. All those live weekly calls, you can ask me anything. You can ask me about uh, salary negotiations. You can ask me about deal flow. Um, 
self uh, productivity tips, whatever it is, it's a great way to get close. It's an amazing community for 1997. Like it's a hell of a value. You can find out about that in the show notes below. So just click that and you know, you can just go ahead and pay and just get access. So, you know, that's probably the best investment you'll make uh, in yourself. I highly encourage it. And if you need a little bit more encouragement, listen to this one sales rep, what he had to say that happened literally within three weeks of him joining the program. Check this out. Amazing testimonial, and I, I keep getting more of those. Another one, uh, Vendela Martin, who sells to gynecolo uh, gynecologic surgeons. Um, you know, she started implementing these these same strategies that she learned from my program, and literally within a few weeks, I see that uh, some of the publications in in the world of OBGYN are tagging a bunch of physicians and then her because they now see her as a peer. So you can get these amazing results. Plus, this really helps position your career so that if you want to move from your company, you want to get into high tech SaaS or something, this is the program to be in. Okay. So join the community, join the program. And lastly, lastly, this is an exciting one. Um, you know, I've always believed that data is like the most important thing to use in medical sales. The problem with it, if you look at, and I don't want to mention any company names, a lot of these providers that give you access to these databases where you can look up physicians, their procedures, their, um, you know, all the data you want on, on physicians so you can target them. Right. The problem is that a lot of these companies, uh, they cost an arm and a leg. And so your company's not going to invest in it. And then they're kind of, you know, it's access to data that everybody has. There's a company I discovered early stage called Alpha Sophia. Okay. A L P H A. And then Sophia spelled S O P H I A. I met up with their uh, founder and CEO, all Paul Lucas Hofschmidt. And, you know, we have the same vision in terms of using these databases and platforms to target early adopters. They have a really impressive platform. That's why I decided to partner up with them. And I love it. And the best part about this is that their, their starting price for just to get a user seat is like 300 bucks a month. So for 300 bucks a month, you get access to their database. You're able to literally look up surgeons, clinicians, providers, and see the not only their case volume, see the types of cases they do, the societies that they're in, find their LinkedIn and Twitter profiles, everything. So as a seller, it's a seller's dream, right? And it's affordable. Now, Alpha Sophia, the one thing I told them is that, hey, if, you know, I love your technology and platform, but I need like a great offer for my audience. Here's their offer. If you go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar, okay, um, enter your information and you get a quick meeting with them, they're going to give you three physician profile searches for free, three. So, you know, figure out your territory, you get on and the, and essentially it's, it, it is a demo of the platform, but in that demo, you're pretty much going to tell them like, Hey, this is my territory. These are surgeons I'm going after. And they're going to give you that information for free. Okay. Whether or not you use them. So go ahead and take advantage of that. Go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar to learn more. Now let's get into this freaking amazing book. This book is insane. Like it is, it is wild as hell. I've read a lot of books. This is wild. So let's, um, where do I start? Let's start with the premise of the book. Okay. So, um, it, you know, so let me, let me give you a little bit of, uh, of, of introduction. I'm going to go through kind of at a high level, what this book is about. Okay. And some details. And then I've made, um, some notes on certain chapters that I want to jump straight to just to read directly from, cause I can't make this up. I have to read directly from the book. Okay. So. In modern operating rooms, it's actually very common to see various individuals other than medical professionals, right? So reps, et cetera, right? Uh, a physician named Dr. Oshner noted that in these rooms, um, they actually serve as a training ground, not something that we, we're all very familiar with uh, for a lot of people, which includes engineers and salesmen. And a lot of these non-medical personnel back in the day um, were observers. There are also a lot of times where their expertise were invaluable. Think about back in the 60s and 70s when a new technology came out. Um, it was very difficult for doctors back then to keep up with training and everything. There's no internet. Um, and so a great example of this that Dr. Oshner um, noted was struggling to identify a pacemaker malfunction. And at that moment, it was a salesman, right, a, medic a medical rep who had a really good eye for detail was able to diagnose the issue and save the potential from, you know, reoperation and harm. Okay. And this isn't in like an isolated incident. There was a lot of renowned surgeons like, uh, Dr. Den Cooley, you know, he's a famous cardiothoracic surgeon competed directly with Dr. DeBakey. Um, and you know, many others who have confirmed that, yeah, you know, we have like technicians and salespeople in our operating theaters and they help. Okay. Um, it's crucial though, to clarify the fact that, um, these non-medical attendees, 
uh, didn't directly participate in their surgeries. Um, however, right back in the day, they did. Right, um, a lot of people assume that sales salespeople and like reps um, were just prevalent in in hospitals because of the lack of exposure to new ex- you know equipment and stuff. Um, well, the other side of it is a lot of these salespeople were scrubbing in, right? And this is kind of um, where the story starts. So Bill Mackay, uh, who's the author, uh, wasn't just any salesman. Um, he was somebody that um, rose up through the ranks in multiple industries, was very um, uh, successful. And ultimately, um, you know, at some point he, you know, needed to make money. He was trying to figure something out and he found himself at becoming a distributor in medical supply sales, right? And he was very good at a job. What made him a great salesperson, he talks about this, is that he studied everything about his product, the problem he solved, everything inside and out. He became so good at that, right, that he built a name for himself. Um, but his interest in knowing the technology inside it kind of pushed him to this new limit. And he went from learning about artificial hips and knees to literally practicing surgical pre- procedures on stolen her- human remains in his garage. So like he would uh, get cadavers, you know, old equipment, and he would start practicing his garage so he can get really good at it. Because back in the day, like it's very overwhelming. Think about like if you're selling different things in sales and then you go and go to OR, right? Um, and he did this mainly just to provide the best support in the operating room. But again, a lot of these surgeons were never exposed to a salesperson like him. And soon they, you know, word got around. They're like, this guy's really good. So that started with them inviting him to assist. And again, keep in mind, think about how many things a surgeon needs to know, right? So today, a lot of med reps are in the, in the OR and they'll provide guidance, like from afar, you know, their surgical training. But back then, they didn't really have training requirements, all these things. So a lot of surgeons are like, okay, I'm going to use this technology. Why don't you come in the OR operating room? Okay, well, I'm having trouble for this. Why don't you scrub in and just help assist on this one case, right? And he just got more and more and more. And this sort of unraveled to the point where um, one surgeon got really frustrated and was like, hey, man, screw you, McKay. If you think you're so good, why don't you just scrub in and just do it? And so the surgeon left. and Everybody kind of looked at McKay and he's like, all right, I'll scrub in and did that part of the case. Okay. And that's where this story kind of goes. So again, they detail that very much. And this kind of gave birth to the term of what's called, and I'm going to uh, tell you the history of this, ghost surgery. Okay. So ghost surgery is a term in which the person who performs the operation, the ghost surgeon or doctor, wasn't the person who's hired or credentialed for the operation. Okay. The ghost surgeon substitutes the higher surgeon while the patient is literally unconscious from anesthesia. Um, uh, it, it was, it, you know, this, this uh, pretty much was coined uh, in place of like uh, unqualified physicians credited with operations, then that moved to salespeople by the late 1970s, uh, following a lot of public pub, uh, public accounts, including this book, right? Uh, it came to refer to multiple kinds of scenarios in which like an individual actually substitutes the officially credentialed surgeon for the for for this, right? And wildly enough, like this kind of continued for a number of decades, even in South Korea. Uh, it was noted that ghost surgery actually boomed in the 2010s with an increased demand for plastic surgery. But then, you know, the government got involved uh, to shut that down. But, you know, what happened was in South Korea, the government was promoting a lot of medical tourism. There's a big boom in plastic surgery, a lot of surgeons overwhelmed. And so, you know, ghost surgery was a thing, right? Um, and then ghost surgeries actually allow surgeons to double book operations and essentially maximize the number of patients they accept. So think of it like this, like, again, it, all around the world, stuff like this can happen where you're a surgeon. If you want to double your revenue, double book your cases and have like a rep in each room, just kind of overseeing that part, either a rep or, an, or a PA or something. And that's how you, ma- you maximize your profit. Because, you know, the one thing we've learned about scale these days is that you're not going to retire on on renting out your time right and even one one um and and in terms of like ghost surgeries one former ghost doctor reported that a lot of substitutes were dentists okay and something i want to i want to note is that again uh, there's a history of surgery you know surgeons come from this guild of barber surgeons where back in the day 
you know, when a physician wanted some cutting, needed some help, you know, doing a surgery, this is like hundreds of years ago, they would call barbers because barbers had like scissors and different things, right? A lot of times they would come from the back door. This is why um, in certain places, uh, surgeons were, are given the title Mr., right? Because, you know, the, the designation of doctor back then for barber surgeons wasn't available because they weren't doctors. So they, they would insist that like, Hey, all right, you, you know, the doctor is going to want me to come and help. You're going to, you're going to address me as Mr. Like a, a higher, higher, higher form of, of, of being addressed. Okay. Now, um, with, with, uh, with this, uh, book, all right. And now, now I want to get into my notes about this book. Okay. Here, here are the uh, chapters. So like, this is what I recommend doing with a lot of books is I actually write on the inside cover. And what I do is uh, shout out to Alex, uh, Alex Wilden, uh, who's, who's a, a book, book influencer. So what I, I picked up something from Alex. So what I do is I normally write a, a, a journal entry of like what's going on in my life, why I buy the book. But something I got from Alex is writing the page, page number on the inside cover of the book and a note. So that way that becomes the actual book. So in the future, when I want to come back or in the case of the podcast, it's all there. So let's jump to the two kinds of reps. Okay. So here are the two kinds of reps. And I'm going to be going straight to the book to outline this. Okay. So during, <laughs> during my match, and I'm reading directly from the book here. So McKay, McKay says, during my mattress selling days, I had noticed there are two kinds of salesmen. Those who take orders and run errands for doctors and those who know their equipment and demonstrate it to surgeons in the operating room. I decided to become the latter kind because, amongst other things, they make the most money. I also decided to become the best medical equipment salesman in the business. This meant, for starters, knowing the equipment, which I could not do merely by reading catalogs. Harry Fontaine was a great help in this respect. Harry Fontaine was a surgeon, by the way. He would sit at my dining room table on Saturday or Sunday morning, spread out the various artificial joints or implants, and teach me how each one is used. After 15 years in the business, he had become an expert on metallurgy and internal fixation, in uh, the, uh, the medical term for repairing and replacing damaged bone in the joints. He not only, by the way, I think Harry Fontaine was another rep, not a surgeon, my mistake. He not only helped me sell the equipment, he taught me more about implants than most doctors learn in any medical school or hospital residency. Um, now, this is, this is the first thing I want to note, okay? And this is like throughout the book. What made, like, you guys wanted some sales tactics? Like, this is the best piece of advice I can give. What made Will McKay stand out to the point that, and again, looking back now, it's like, yeah, medical malpractice. Like, why would you let a salesman come and do surgery? No, no surgeon, and, and McKay mentions this in the book, no surgeon did that with unless they thought that that was going to be the absolute best decision for the patient. So they believed wholeheartedly that, hey, this guy knows the technology and the equipment way 10 times better than I do. He's seen this procedure more. I feel even like the surgeon were surgeons were so confident that they're like, you know, they're the patient is in better hands for this part of the procedure with the sales rep, right? Okay. Now let's talk about really screwed up things to do to your competition. Okay. So um, Will, Will, William McKay, uh, talks about, uh, 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 competitive practices and selling medical equipment. Okay. And so I'm going to detail this out, uh, <laughs> from the book. Okay. And, uh, yeah, this is like story time for you guys. All right. Competitive practices in selling medical equipment, like those in other fields ranged from the primitive to the sophisticated. At primitive rep level, salesmen would lie about one another professionally and personally. One, for example, might enter a hospital and learn that his competitor had the day before told the staff he gives poor service or that the product he sells has had many clinical failures. Or a salesman might tell a doctor, did you hear that about so-and-so really screwed up at blank and blank hospital? His competitors might retaliate. Did you know blank company had just a price increase when in fact it had not? A salesman attempting to discredit a competitor's character might tell a happily married operating room supervisor that his colleague was about to leave his wife and family for another woman. When I divorced and remarried in October 1975, people claim, my God, he stole the operating room supervisor at Hospital X away from a doctor. Uh, competition at its worst led one salesman to pour five pounds of domino sugar down another one's ga gas tank. 
One day I walked out of the hospital and found all four of my tires slashed. Okay. So that's the primitive level. Even within the company, the salesmen vied against one another. We all wanted to be Harry Fontaine's number one boy. The salesman in New York would come into the office and claim Dr. So-and-so is complaining about the queen salesman. My favorite competitive ploy was to give spectacular sales presentations complete with charts and graphs at Harry's monthly meetings. My performances helped win me the general sales manager's uh, position for the New York area. At the most rewarding level, a good salesman knew his product better than any of his competitors. Again, this is a repeating theme, my friends. A lot of you guys want like super black magic ninja sales tactics. The best sales tactic is to know your product inside and out, know the procedure inside and out, know the, like everything about it, medical history, et cetera. When you're looked at as an authority figure by your clinician, you own the business, right? That's, that's the best way. Let me ask you this. In my industry, okay, when it comes to like selling and doing all these things, why do you think that I'm able to get this, these kind of engagements with these types of companies? I make sure to make it very clear that on an education level, on a practice, practical level, everything, I know this stuff inside and I cannot go toe to toe, right? And I, and I made sure to do the same thing as a, as a rep, okay? So uh, going back to this. So for example, two salesmen might sell essentially the same air drill at the same price at exhibit tables in the same room of the same hospital. So back then you used to be able to go and set up a table, an exhibit table and sell your product, right? That's why they call it carrying the bag, okay? So in this case, two salespeople, different companies, same price, same model, same everything, okay? The question then becomes, does salesman A know more about his equipment than salesman B knows about his? And can salesman A impart that knowledge to the doctor and convince him he knows more? Can salesman A build rapport with that doctor? If salesman A can uh, ever gets caught not knowing what he is talking about, the doctor will lose faith in him. But if salesman A gains the doctor's confidence, a closer relationship will develop. The salesman will learn the doctor's capabilities or lack of them, and the two will begin basically to communicate. The doctor wants somebody in whom he can place confidence in. He does not want someone to summon five salesmen and evaluate five knees to decide which is best. He does not want to read a 10 page brochure. What he does, what he does want to tell, hopefully Bill McKay, I'm doing a total knee in a week from today and then forget about it because he knows that I will have the knee and all the instruments he needs in the operating room that day. So let's step back here and summarize what is the number one tactic you can do to get all the business and keep it? Know your stuff inside and out. Know it better than the surgeon. If you know the product, the procedure, the literature, key, and you keep up to date with it better than the surgeon, not only – because think about what surgery is about. Surgery is about it's – a, it's a highly coordinated act, right? And so if you are able to get unwavering trust from the doctor where you're like, hey, this – you know, you need, what you need to think about yourself as a salesperson is that you are an extension of your technology. And a lot of surgeons stick with one specific company or implant, not just because they like that technology, it's because of the servicing and support that that implant comes with. They will not change products because of risk of losing that one rep. I remember for, me, for myself, right? And, the, and again, if you, wanna, if you wanna go to another level, know, not only be great in the OR, be great for the doctor's practice. I really made sure, aside from being great clinically, I made sure to be such a great asset for the doctor's office when it came to do to marketing the practice, doing patient events. And I unfortunately did such a damn good job that when I, you know, was promoted, you know, one of my surgeons and their office manager were like, ro they were royally pissed off that I was leaving. Like it was a really uncomfortable dinner. You know, I remember that, you know, so, so that's what you can do. Okay. Um, and and I, and again, a lot of you may not like this, but what I would say is like, think of it like this. Um, if let's, let's, this is the best way to answer the question. Do you know what the hell you're doing? I want you to think about your, 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 um, your, your, your specialty, whether it's urology or, you know, anything else, you know, if you're in urology, you know, um, or, uh, I don't know too many people in, in, in urology. Okay, like, okay, let's go with urology. Okay, if you're in urology and you focus on one specific, like radical prostatectomy, and you met Dr. Vip Patel, who's done more radical prostatectomies than anybody on planet Earth, can you hold a conversation with him? 
Can you have an engaging conversation with them? Can you, can you make points referencing clinical literature, new techniques, past techniques, where maybe you're not trying to outdo him. That's not the point, but the point where you could, where based on your answers and questions about, about that procedure, his, his mind goes and thinks, wow, this person really knows what they're doing. Right. Can you have that conversation? If you're in orthopedics, right. Right. If you talk about, let's say, you know, uh, a total joint replacement and you have a conversation with Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Jacobs, right. Or Matt Barber, right. You know, um, can you do it to a level where they're like, man, not only do they know about the product, like they know about this procedure. If you're in biologics, you talk to Don, Don Buford, right. Can, can you, can you demonstrate that it goes and I've talked about these levels of a rep, right. Lowest level of a rep, you just know your product and the basics of troubleshooting it. Level above that is like, you know, your products and your competitors' products. Level above that is like your products, your competitors' products, surrounding technologies for the procedure, right? The highest level rep clinically in my mind is that you know everything about the procedure from the moment that they make the incision to the moment that they close up and suture it up and everything in between right? To the point that a surgeon will come to you. And this is a great indicator. Do you know your stuff? Does your surgeon come to you and say, Hey, I'm thinking about using this, this, this new product or technology from a completely different company. Have you heard anything about it? What are your thoughts? Like when you're getting solicited like that, that says something. Okay. Not easy to do. Okay. Let's get into some more juicy details here. Okay. One of the notes that I have and again, this is written in 1978. Not much has changed, right? Sometimes the best advice, my friends, look, sales channels change, platforms, and everything. Some of the best advice has not changed. You know, books come and go. You know, if a book lasts a year, it's, it's a good book. If it lasts a decade, it's a great book. If it lasts, ha you know, half a century, it's a classic, right? That's why one of the most sophisticated books on marketing, shout out to... Uh, the mad device rep who bought this book and read it and was like, dude, it's a great book. Uh, Breakthrough advertising. That book uh, up until a few a year or two ago used to go for four or 500 bucks. That's when I bought it, right? Um, now it, they started republishing it. It's still $100, right? That book was written in the 50s. Most sophisticated book on marketing because it talks about human psychology. So anyways, Bill McKay on page 19 and page 20 said, Ultimately, when it comes to selling to doctors and hospitals, ultimately the salesman sells hospital personnel the same thing he sells a doctor, service. So when an OR supervisor would ask me to deliver an out-of-stock item, I would jump in my car and deliver it immediately, just as I would for a doctor, okay? Are you doing that? Are you providing that level of service for, as a rep? You know, one of the things that built Stryker into a billion-dollar behemoth was that they were radical about customer service. They still are right? Are you doing that? Okay. Let's jump to another, uh, another point. Okay. One of the things I mentioned, I set up nights and studied these resources, cramming as much as I could in the head. The biggest problem was making the words mean something. A book would describe the three points at which the surgeon drill, drills holes into the acetabular cup during a total hip procedure. So I wrote questions on three by five cards and carried them in my pocket. Whenever I found a friendly surgeon who really knew his business, I cornered him in the hallway and, or invited him to a cup of coffee. Then I asked him to illustrate the discussion on a napkin or a scrap of paper. Thanks to dozens of helpful surgeons, my reading became more meaningful. Okay. Surgeons, doctors in general, it is a culture of continuing education and learning. Okay. There's a reason why many years ago I started a book show because physicians love education. And then when, and I think the easiest way to find your way into an operating room is to ask a surgeon, Hey, can I please shadow you to learn how you do X, Y, Z procedure? You have to ask yourself deeper questions like, okay, if the, like we all know that's the easiest way to get into an operating room. Why though? You have to ask these questions. Okay. You have to ask these questions. Why does this exist? The bet, the quality of your life, the amount of money you make okay, will be reflected in the quality of questions you're able to ask yourself, okay? So when I asked myself that question a decade ago, why is it that that's the easiest way to get into a surgeon's OR? And I did some studying research. It's because there's a, a culture of continuing education for physicians. They are all uh, focused on this idea of apprenticeship. Because remember, before there was a time like medical schools, that, you know, the, uh, medical schools and residency, that's kind of a new thing. 
Like there are medical schools that have existed, but hundreds of years ago, there was no such thing. How did surgeons and doctors train? Through apprenticeship, through teaching, okay? So that's why, okay? Now, again, you want, you want, a, you want a great sales tactic from me? Because again, I know all of you guys are looking for a shortcut. That's, that's okay. I'm, I, I'm down with shortcuts. Spend more time on LinkedIn digesting medical content. If you, if you are not already doing it, okay, this is a little freebie out of my own course, go look up the hashtags relevant to your specialty. So if you're an orthopedic, you should be following orthopedic surgery, orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic spelled both the British and, 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 and American way, because you know, there's two different spellings. And then, and then procedures related to it, arthroplasty, knee replacement, whatever it is. So you can start seeing the exact procedures and, 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 and publications coming out, right? These surgeons are publishing their cases live every single day for no other reason except that this is the way they're able to scale education and get insights from everybody else. That's, that's why doctors are spending more time on LinkedIn and posting because think about it. Not everybody's you know, going to go up on podium with double AOS or AOA or whatever. They can post a case live to their peers, get feedback from the top surgeons in the world, and then change the way they do it the next day. That's all there to see. So you can be learning from that. And as an example, let's say you, for whatever reason, you, you don't want to post on LinkedIn, which there's no reason why you shouldn't. You can. And, and by the way, your HR, it's, it's not against your HR policy. You can't post about procedures, but you can post on LinkedIn, right? Um, you can learn about those procedures. One rep, uh, actually one, he was, he was in my program a year ago, uh, was at a company where he was just very nervous about posting, never posted, but he would go through and, and read through the clinical posts for this one uh, 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 cardiothoracic procedure, right? And would follow different surgeons and learn, and then ran into a big CT surgeon in the hospital, somebody he's been trying to convert, uh, goes up to the surgeon and says, hey, Dr. So-and-so, um, my name is XYZ, I'm, I'm with the company. By the way, like I, I, I follow these different surgeons on LinkedIn, and I noticed this one procedure that, that was posted, this is the technique they used. I'm wondering, why do, you, why do you approach this procedure with this other technique? Like, is there a reason why I haven't used this technique? And the surgeon, was like, wow, like actually I follow those surgeons too. And I never knew about that technique. Nobody ever asked me why, but I guess that's, I mean, I'm just trained that way, but I, I actually would be open to trying this other way. And that's how we got into to the operating room. Okay. You got to think more creatively. Okay. And, and my point about this is that take, don't take my, my words. Let me, let me reference one of the greatest capital sales leaders in our industry, Christopher sales, who passed away, you know, a couple of years ago one of my late mentors, one of the best pieces of advice he gave me, be a student of the game, be a student of the game, right? And how do you become a student of the game? You sit on your butt, nights, weekends, you study. You want to make money in this industry? You sit down, you put in the work. If you, if you wake up every day and you just throw your scrubs on, you get in the car, you put your equipment in, and you turn on the radio, and you, just, and you check out and just go to the hospital, you're going to lose. Do you wake up with a plan? Right? Do you do you have a do you have a system you go through? Do you have daily activities you go through every single day, every Friday or every 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 you know uh, whatever it might be? Does does the surgery department in your hospital they have a journal club? Do you join those journal club meetings? Right? Do you keep up with the literature? Okay, like what are you doing? You want to you want to go up in this industry? The number one way to move up in this industry, whether you're in sales, or you want to go into marketing or product management or anything else. Know whatever you're doing inside and out from the clinical aspect of it, the economic aspect of it, the marketing aspect, all these different things. Knowledge is not power unless it's put into action. Acquire the knowledge, put it into action. People will notice. They will gravitate to you like moths to a light. That was the biggest insight that I got early in my career. Okay. And I would say things worked out for me pretty damn well. Okay. Let's move forward. All right. Let's see. Next note. Knowledge sells. All right. That was the next one. Okay. You guys seeing a theme here, by the way? Because again, look, I poured through this pay, this this book. It's a 200 page book. It's not that long. But I went through here with a fine tooth comb to be like, okay, what are the sales tactics that, that, that my audience is going to love? This is it. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So first time, so the first time <laughs> good old, good old Billy McKay uh, touched a patient was in 1974 during the surgical inst installation of an artificial knee. Okay, total knee arth arthroplasty. Okay, given the unorthodox nature of my medical education, 
I was as ready as I could be expected for it. One February afternoon, I visited the orthopedic surgeon in my territory to tell him about different implants I sold and per to persuade him to switch to my product line. Okay, On that particular day, he had something to sell me. He had a daughter who worked for him, an attractive girl in her 20s. By the way, keep in mind, this is the 1970s, so like I'm not filtering this book at all. So if, it, if you're offended already, I'm sorry. I'm just reading from the book. Um, an attractive girl in her 20s, and as I sat down to talking to him, I did not wear a wedding band those days. I could see the idea take shape. He called for a patient's file, and when she brought it into the room, he made his move. Oh, honey, do you know Bill McKay? As soon as she left, he said, so uh, you married Bill? I replied, yeah, I've got a couple kids. And he said, oh, I could see the matchmaker's anticipation drain from his face. Now he was ready to, to really talk business. It was a ritual that was becoming all too familiar. And it began something like this. I have a candidate for a total hip and I'm scheduling this patient for three weeks from today. Bring me all the literature because I haven't decided which hip to use yet. He tells me this. He tells this to four different salesmen and the one who seems the smartest and most knowledgeable sells the hip. When I bring him the prosthesis, however, I cannot say, I know you've never done a total hip, but don't worry, I'll get you through the case. I never ask, are you going to use my prosthesis? I'm tactful and positive. So Bill McKay goes on to say, doctor, let me make a suggestion. I'll go over to the hospital and in-service the nurses so they'll be familiar with the instruments and know how we are going to do this case. Then. I give him the big laminga, as I call it. We both know that when I give an in-service, only about 10% of the nurses pay attention. And about 10% of that 10% comprehend what I'm talking about. So let me make this suggestion. Suppose I come in on the case and make sure the nurses hand you the proper instruments, since it's the first total hit we've done at this hospital. The surgeon goes, oh. Have you been in these before? Doctor, I go in on all total hips all the time. Oh, suddenly he looks at me like I am the great white hope. To himself, he says, he can talk me through this case. Thus, the basic deal is struck. And let me deconstruct that. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the surgeon is the maestro. He or she is the captain of the ship. And if you study, as I've uh, mentioned in the past, the book, The 48 Laws of Power, law number one is never outshine the master. Too many reps make the mistake where in the OR, they're thinking that, hey, I'm impressing the surgeon with my knowledge, when in reality, they're just showing that they're more knowledgeable than the surgeon and pissing the surgeon off. The number one thing you can do in your career whether it's with the surgeon or your boss, is to elevate them and make them the hero. You just hang out in the background. So if you do a great job of making your surgeon look like a, sh a sh knight in shining armor in surgeries, if you make him or her, you know, the, the, bell, the bell of the ball at, 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 at conferences, they will want to work with you. Make them look good and, they'll, and you'll go far. So are you guys getting the, getting the, the theme here? All right. Let's let's keep going. All right. Let's go to the uh the first the first patient case. Okay. So the first patient case, okay. Man, this was really bad. Oh yeah, so I'm gonna skip I'm gonna skip uh 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 <laughs> skip this part, but like essentially, I mean the first patient case, I mean, it was just wild. And so like as doctors become more flustered with new technology, either they're just gonna abandon or or pretty much say, screw it. You want you want this to go through? You want me to use this? You do it. Okay. So when so when uh, Bill McKay stepped into his very very first case, right? This is essentially what happening. Um, they were working on uh, let's see, was it a total hip? Doesn't matter. Okay. Essentially, um, uh, he was he was trying to, to to console a very frustrated surgeon. We've all been there, right? Um, but his his uh, help was adding to his frustration okay he continued to fume and suddenly picked up an instrument i never saw what and threw it across the room yeah that's that 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 shit happened back in the day i've seen that happen even dr perth i said the lag screw is in and we'll get the plate in too but perth was not to be consoled you put the effing thing in he bellowed and strode it into the next room and started looking at x-rays on the view box 
The moment I realized that he had turned the entire case over to me and left the operating solo, I felt shocked. Then fear set in. I had stepped into cases before, but never alone with only an anesthesiologist and scrub nurse on my side. Okay. So that's how it all started. Right. And then it just spiraled out of control there because he did such, again, keep in mind, this guy was like in his garage working on cadavers and just trying to, just trying to be a very knowledgeable salesman. And as a result, got so good at it that surgeons were like, yeah, let me just get Bill McKay to do this. Like he's going to do this better than I, because he knows the technology better. He's seen these cases. It'll be the best thing for the patient. Okay. Now let's get to the total sale. Okay. Um, this is, uh, you know, from chapter six, this is, gets more into sales tax. So a colleague in orthopedic in the orthopedic business once called me the best salesman he had ever met. Since he was a competitor and a good salesman himself, I took this statement to be the highest praise. Selling is difficult, but it is a cutthroat business. The key is to sell your company's product. If you fail, financially speaking, you're dead. So I sold as hard as I could. And sometimes I made friends and sometimes I made enemies, but it was all part of the game. My selling technique was based on two premises. First, I would give the best possible service to doctors. Secondly, I had to know more about the implants than anyone else, including the competition and sometimes the surgeons themselves. With time and experience, my technique evol uh, evolved to the total sale, right? It worked best on a Saturday morning when I attended a hospital's monthly orthopedic conference where the doctors could meet and discuss recent cases of interest. I was specifically interested in attending the meetings at smaller private hospitals for they were my biggest accounts. At the large teaching hospitals also held orthopedic conferences, but I was less interested in them because they, uh, they dealt mainly with trauma cases. In my scale of prior priorities, the opportunities to sell an artificial hip costing $350 were outranked a dollar, uh, $1.85 pen used in an average trauma case. Okay, so just taking a, a quick, quick step back, um, highlighting the main points here. What made this guy so successful? Extremely knowledgeable about his products, the competitor's products more than surgeons, and to provide a great service. You do those two things, right? You will win, right? Outside of that, if you don't win, you know, you can't, you know, it's, you've done everything you can, right? Now, here's another uh, interesting tactic that I, I titled how to hold an audience. Um, so this is when Bill McKay was doing an in-service or, or presenting or something. I would try to hold my audience in thrall as long as possible since it meant 20 or so fewer doctors I would have to chase afterwards in their office. This I did in a variety of ways. One of the most effective ways to engage in debate with one of the doctors or was to engage in a debate with one of the doctors. I recall one occasion when a doctor remarked that a specific type of hip was easiest to implant because the greater tr trochanter uh, did not have to be removed and the implant more closely resembled the natural hip. He added that these hips were made of vitalium, a cobalt chromium alloy that is more inert than surgical steel. When he finished, I asked, are you familiar with the recent report in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery on the repeated breakage of this type of stem? The surgeon would reply, no, I'm not. Doctor, are you familiar with the reports by two doctors in Massachusetts on the reaction of tissue to vitalium? No answer. Are you aware of the reports of the fatigue factor of vitalium to, as opposed to CO? And so he would go on and on. And so the, uh, my, his object uh, or I'm going to read directly. My object was to overwhelm him, overwhelm him with expertise. My debates usually succeeded because I did my homework. Now I don't recommend going and being combative with doctors, but keep in mind, this is part of surgical culture. If you sell robots, you know what I'm talking about. So when I used to be a Missouri robotics, um, I had to really prep for war when we would go to a conference because when, in the early days, when we were trying to push robotic spine surgery, um, our robot was pretty much a punching bag for a lot of surgeons. So I had to be prepared to go toe to toe, not just me, but also uh, other reps, you know, and people and s some people who I felt were masterful at handling these debates. Um, big shout out to Robbie Breedlove and Matt Afshari, uh, who are our sales training managers. I think 90% of all Missouri trained surgeons went through them. And I think 100% of sales had to be done with a training lab with with Robbie Matt in the early days. And so you have to know how to debate clinically, and that starts by knowing the clinical uh, research inside and out. Okay. Um, now, the last thing I want to I want to uh, touch on, and then I'm going to sort of share like how exactly you know like why did this guy write a book about this stuff? Um, 
spoiler alert, he got sued. Um, but um, one of the things that he mentions in the book, which is really interesting, is that like this, you know, these kind of rival rivalries, right? You, you see it on the medical sales side. It's also part of co the culture of medicine. So surgeons, I mean, they're like this today. Um, physicians in general, but definitely back then. So like, uh, for example, being on the roster of a hospital, doctors would virtually lie and reading from the book, lie, cheat and ingratiate themselves with emergency room nurses in order to increase their share of emergency room time, because that's where they get referrals. One orthopedic surgeon who considered himself quite a ladies man, uh, courted the nurses until they started recommending him instead of the doctor on call to attend the case. Again, I'm reading from the book, people, so I don't want to get canceled, but you know, I'm just reading from the book that was written in 1978. I can feel the, the woke warriors coming into my comments. I delete them, by the way, because I'm just not going to put up with that stuff. Um, probably not for this one, though. It helps, it helps with the engagement of the algorithm, so joke's on you. Um, now, how did this all sort of end? Okay, and by the way, some of the headlines uh, when this came out, the wrong hand on the knife, salesman relates role uh, in surgery. I have no illusions about being a doctor, but I'm an expert on implants. Surgical salesman admits to assisting in over 900 New York operations. Uh, salesman drilled into patient's skull to show a surgeon how it could be done. False patient data reported a hearing. A salesman surgery saved, saved the life. Uh, amateur hour, anyone for surgery, amateur surgeon. So these are all the crazy headlines that came out as a result of this. How did this happen? Let me tell you. In 1975, um, the uh, uh, Will McCain, uh, which again, he was a GM, general sales manager for a prosthetics company, participated in the uh, orthopedic surgery of a, of a patient named Franklin Morando at the request of the lead surgeons, David Lipton and Harold Massoff. What happened next was that, you know, Keep in mind, this is what's reported in the news. McKay had never gone to high school, had no medical training, uh, but was interested in surgery. And by the time of Miranda's operation, he had been frequently involved in surgical procedures, especially those with prosthetics. McKay was present for Miranda's operation while his hip was replaced, using the equipment from his company, feeling that his advice was being ignored by Liptim and Massoff. Um, McKay left to go golfing, but was called back to the operating room by Lipton and Massoff when it was discovered the implant had come loose. McKay spent three and a half hours operating, and it was later found that the medical records had been manipulated to remove evidence of McKay's participation in the operation. Okay. And again, like, let's face it, like, I've, this feels familiar to me. I mean, not scrubbing into the surgery, but you're in a surgery, you're maybe trying to provide guidance to a surgeon. They're not listening. So you're like, all right, I'm, I'm bouncing. Like, what can I do? All right. Or at least back in the day. Right. Uh, Miranda, uh, the patient, uh, was pretty much crippled by this 10 hour operation because his, uh, one leg ended up being like two inches shorter than the other filed a $2 million malpractice suit against Lipton, Massoff and Smithtown general hospital. The case was settled out of court for a million dollars in 1980. He stated he was, and the patient was unaware of McKay's involvement when suing and that the file and he filed the suit because the surgery had only worsened his condition. Lipton and Massoff were indicted for allowing a non-licensed person to practice medicine and for manipulation of medical records, but charges were dropped in 1978 after the district attorney spearheading the investigation was defeated for re-election. And when, when McKay wrote this book, you know, he pretty much did it to kind of document like how he kind of got involved in all of this, right? And I think that in the most part, what McKay is documenting was like, he got really good at something. The surgeon's he trusted the surgeon's decision because if the surgeons felt that he would be the best choice for 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 uh, that part of the patient's care, he was okay with it. Um, and it kind of all came unraveled when the fact that these two surgeons didn't want to listen to him about how to use uh, the device, and he decided to leave the OR. And when he was called back because they made a you know a really bad mistake, he was the one who had to scrub in and undo that mistake, and they manipulated you know medical records, and so. The the conclusion of the book that McKay had is just that he hopes that as a result of this book that ghost surgery, you know, that they would le legislation would come out to protect patients against ghost surgery. This would not happen because, again, back in the day, you know, it was just like as a surgeon, it's like, hey, how can I make more money? I'll book more cases and just, you know, oversee them and either have like reps or nurses. And again, some countries, dentists do that part of the procedure and I'll, I'll be good. Right. Um, so, yeah. This is wild as hell. 
Um, you can you can find the PDF version of this book somewhere online if you look hard enough. Again, uh, if you want to get a hardcover copy or just a physical copy of this, um, it's uh, six hundred bucks. Uh, I took care of that on this show. But if anybody knows the whereabouts of William McKay, I'd love to have this guy on my show. I tried to do some research, but just you know, didn't I haven't looked hard enough. Um, but let's kind of wrap up with this. What are the main conclusions here? If you want to get, first of all, wild story, right? It's important to know our history as sales reps, including, again, like the quality questions you ask yourself are going to be dictated. Let me, let me start, uh, repeat that. Sorry. Um, the quality of your career, quality of your life, the quality of your success is going to be reflected in the quality of questions you ask yourself. So working in this industry, when you hear things like, Hey, carry the bag, carry the bag, carry the bag, you should inquire to understand why do we say that? And you learn that, oh, that's because back in the day, you carry the bag in to the doctor's lounge, open it up and say, hey, doc, here, here are the new tools I got. Here's what's new. Let, what do you want to use in the case? Okay. But the most important takeaways from this book are things that are still timeless advice. You want to be uh, irreplaceable in the OR. You want to get all the business. You want your name to mean something. You can do that through two things. Unwavering, unmatched knowledge of what you do which includes your products, the surgeries, the pathologies, the clinical research, everything. Like you need to, you need to uh, emit this energy that like that person knows everything about this procedure. The people I worked with at Missouri, again, Matt Afshari, Ro Robbie Breedlove, Sean Stewart, Jason Carl, like, and the list goes on. These people trained everybody, including themselves and myself, to know that you know the you know spinal fusion and specifically robotic inside and out unwavering so that to the point that clinicians looked at us as peers because when we planned surgeries the surgery did not happen unless our rep was in the room and we were able to have clinical discussion and guide the procedures so that the robot was used in the most effective and efficient way right so know 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 your procedure know everything in inside inside and out i don't care if you have to make note cards whatever a lot of you complain about oh the procedure guide and you know every rep that's reached out to me for advice i was asking like how well do you know your procedure guide and if it's not inside and out like you better know that stuff like goodwill like matt damon and goodwill hunting right then you, you can't be successful all right you know you got to know your products you got to know the problem that you're solving right when you become an expert at the problem not just your product when you become an expert at the problem right that's when you're going to have a monopoly on things. Okay. And again, I'm, I'm going to, I don't mean to brag about myself here, but I'm just going to use myself as an example. When it comes to selling through social media to hospitals and physicians and clinicians selling and marketing, I am the most authoritative on that, on like on planet earth when it comes to that, because I've spent countless hours, not only of course, research and studying, but actually doing the work, getting the results, understanding it so well. When anybody thinks of like, hey, how do we use social media sell to doctors? I'm it. There are plenty of other people. There are other people who do this, who talk about it, but not like me. You know, when you become the one and only, that's when all, you get all the business. This is why. And again, I'm. This is a solo pod. So I don't promote these. That's why I'm. I'm. I'm a little bit more intimate with the audience. This is why. Like, if you look at Clary, Clary is a software company. They do not sell medical devices. Clary sells software to businesses. They're a B2B SaaS company. Why did they come to me? Because when they thought of like medical sales, right? And selling digitally, I was the one and only, right? That's the reputation you should develop, right? That, that nobody will go to toe to toe with you on those things. And so clinically, again, I'm not telling you to be combative, right? What I'm telling you is be a student of the game. If you show surgeons and the OR staff that you are, you are all in on this thing, you're not just like some fly by night rep that's like showing up randomly. You know, it's like, oh yeah, call me when you need it and everything. We all know the type. We all know the type, right? But when you show that you're in it, right? That you're you're spending your spare time studying the procedure, keeping up with new technologies. You know, you talk to the surgeon, say, hey, you know, when the when the hospital does the next journal club or these procedure, can I please be in the room? I'm not gonna, you know, say anything. Can I be in the room? If the answer is no. It's like totally okay. Can you let me know what journal journal uh, publications you guys are reading? I'd love to read them. Sometimes like when I was in startups, like I didn't have uh, access to the journals 
And so I asked the physicians like, Hey, doctor, I'm, you know, I'm part of a startup. We don't have, uh, um, like a login for that, for that journal. Could you send me a PDF of that? Uh, I want to keep up to date. People respect you. When you become a student of the game, people respect that long, long number one, right? And the number two thing, right? In no specific order, just provide unbelievable customer service, right? Like you should, you should be able to show that you're moving heaven and hell to, to make things happen, right? And that's not just for the doctors, right? This is a theatric that you have to do for supply chain, for the OR director, et cetera. If you're in a small hospital, go and introduce yourself to the hospital CEO and say, hey, you know, I've been spending a lot of time studying and seeing, you know, what hospitals are doing on the marketing side and everything. Can I help in some way? Right. I, I noticed you guys were doing this uh, patient educational seminar for this random thing that has nothing to do with me. Can I help with that? Like, I actually, I have some, I have some thoughts on some, some ways I can promote. I'm happy to help. Like, get involved. That way, when you show up to the hospital, you're not just another rep. People look at you and say, hey, that's our account executive for whatever it might be. And every hospital, like they, there's a rep like that where people in the hospital, they know that person by name. That's not just, they're not a rep. You know what I mean? And when you develop that kind of reputation, okay, when you leave one company, you go to another, surgeons will be genuinely interested to learn about that company because they say, if that person is willing to go work at that company, that company must be really special for that, that rep to decide to work for them, okay? And again, I'm not just using myself as an example. I put in so much work on my knowledge base, on my success, on all these things, including active. And this can't be limited to, to uh, uh, quarters on the hallway. That's why I picked up using LinkedIn, because aside from promoting things that I'm learning, customer success, clinical studies, all these different things to prospective customers, doctors who are not related to, to the prospective customers I was, I was saying are seeing that. Companies are seeing that. And so I made my brand professionally well-known so that when I go to a new company, it was very easy for me to tap you know, uh, surgeons that I never sold to before because they, they spend like a year or two watching me do this, right? And so I, I really implore you that you gotta, you gotta really embrace this new approach, right? Using social media for social selling, okay? And outside of that, very simply put, something you can start tomorrow. Know your product inside and out. Just be a wealth of knowledge. You know, your product, your competitor's products, the procedure, the pathologies, et cetera, okay? And the new, new research attached to it. And number two is how can you provide the best quality of service? And, do, and look, be creative. When you ask questions like that, okay, how do I provide the best quality of service? Like, like, I'll give you an example. When I thought about that 10 years ago, you know what I did? I didn't look at the medical industry. What did I do? I looked at the hotel industry because I'm like, well, who's, who's great at service? Hotels and, and restaurants. And I was like, okay, well, what's the most luxurious? That's led me down the path to, to learn about the Ritz-Carlton. The Ritz-Carlton has a book talking about how they provide the best quality of hospitality. Take these ideas that are multi-billion dollar ideas that are for free, okay, from these industries, steal them and turn them into your own thing, right? That's how you get better at this game. So it's a long rant. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this, this book review. Again, I bought this book and read it and did all this work for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was, it was exciting. So if you're watching this on YouTube or Spotify, scroll down, rate this episode. Um, you, you, there's actually polls. You can leave a comment even on Spotify. Like, tell me what you think about this episode. Tell me if you like it. Give me more ideas on all hail medical sales. And again, look, there's, I know for a fact, because we have numbers, there's thousands of subscribers to our podcast. But we don't have thousands of reviews, so please do me a big favor. Um, this show gets better the more reviews it gets, the more it gets discovered. I, I'm able to get more funding for the show, more sponsorship. Give the show a five star review, write a review, click, hit that subscribe button, and then share this. Please forward it on to somebody. Okay. And the last thing I'll say is that if you have a sales team, and you guys need some training. Hit me up. I'm happy to train your team. I'm also doing a lot of CME based content. You know. I'm, I'm in a position now with the company where we're doing more of these trainings and helping companies. Uh, I meant it, my friends, a year ago when I said, my mission is to partner with the right people. We're going to change the way we sell and market in this industry. And it's happening. With that being said, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Really enjoyed it as always. And uh, I'll see you all next time. 
Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of The State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at katibandco.com. Take care and we'll see you next time.